Greetings, folks, and welcome to the wonderful world of early modern feminism, and in particular, to our little discussion of Jane Anger's wonderful pamphlet, succinctly titled, Her Protection for Women, to Defend Them Against the Scandalous Reports of a Late Surfeiting Lover and All Other Like Venarians That Complain So to Be Overcloyed with Women's Kindness, written by Jane Anger, Gentlewoman. My objective for this little talk is not to go into too much detail with the pamphlet itself, though I will be pursuing a few lines of thought there, but rather to discuss the context into which Jane Anger's writing, without which I think there's really no way to understand what she's actually up to. In order to do that, I will have to look fairly bluntly at medieval and early modern notions on women that any modern reader cannot help but see as misogynistic, or at least that any intellectually honest modern reader cannot help but see as misogynistic. In doing so, I will have to look at some of the ways in which the religious discourse of the time was deployed against the interests of women, quite explicitly so. And in doing that, I just want to be very clear here that I'm not attacking anyone's religion. I'm looking at the institutional and historic deployment of particular texts not at any truth claims or beliefs that may underlie the writings of those texts or that may be important to anyone who adheres to them. Or in other words, I just need to be very clear that a criticism of an institution is not the same as a criticism of a religion. And with all of that being said, what say we get on with things? The first thing we should probably do is just take a look at the status of women in Catholic Europe prior to the Protestant Reformation and then go from there. Because, of course, there's a long history lying behind what Jane Anger is doing here, and I want to encapsulate as much of that as I possibly can in this brief discussion. So what I should probably do is go back fairly far toward the beginning and point out that after the conversion, the status of women in Northern Europe took a serious nosedive. The social values or mores emanating up from Rome and the Mediterranean generally were far more strictly patriarchal, far more regimented than the mores of the displaced worldviews. Women were, with a few very rare exceptions, shut out of public affairs and tended even in noble families to remain uneducated, again with some notable exceptions. But I'm speaking here of general patterns. Women could not inherit or hold property, and when universities became a thing, were unable to attend them. There was also a very large body of discourse condemning women, attacking women in pretty much every way imaginable, and this discourse emanated from the highest authority. I'll give you a few examples, again, not to throw stones, but to illustrate the intellectual culture against which Jane Anger is responding. You, unless you know what she's responding to, you have no idea what she's actually doing. But this little gem by Tertullian, an early church father, will probably help you understand. According to Tertullian, woman is, and I quote, a temple built over a sewer, a gateway to the devil. Woman, you are the devil's doorway. You led astray one whom the devil would not dare attack directly. It was your fault that the Son of God had to die. You should always go in mourning and rags. And Tertullian wasn't the only one to view women in such a negative light. Here we have Augustine. Woman was merely man's helpmate, a function which pertains to her alone. She is not the image of God. But as far as man is concerned, he is by himself the image of God. That is, for Augustine, the image of God is a masculine image, and it does not extend into women. Augustine, of course, here is appealing to the creation story in which God fashions Adam out of dust and then Eve from one of Adam's ribs, and this is something to which we'll return when we get to Jane Anger herself because she addresses it. But as long as we're on the topic of Augustine, here's another little gem of his. What is the difference whether it is a wife or a mother? It is still Eve the temptress that we must be aware of in any woman. I fail to see what use woman can be to man if one excludes the function of bearing children. I could go on at great length, but for the sake of brevity, I won't. Instead, I think I'll take a look at a little bit of scripture that was often also deployed against women's interests. 
And this as well is something that Jane Anger addresses herself, so it's quite topical to the work that we're looking at. Eve, for example, typically bears most of the blame, as we saw with Augustine and Tertullian, for that whole apple kerfuffle in the garden. And numerous examples in the literature of the time drew upon biblical women, for example, Delilah and her betrayal of Samson, to illustrate the perfidious nature of women. Now, that being said, other examples were also drawn to defend women, so I'm not trying to assert that the Bible is an unambiguously anti-feminist document. What I'm concerned with, as I said, is the deployment of the text. For example, the oft-cited passage in Ephesians 5.22, Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Or, if you prefer, there's always 1 Corinthians 14, verses 33 to 35. As in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or if you prefer 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. She is to keep silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived, and became the transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. And again, on that whole order of creation thing, we'll get to that when Jane Anger does. In the meantime, if you want to look more at the inferior status of women in the New Testament, and here we look particularly at Paul, there's always 1 Corinthians 11, which I won't read at length, but that demands that women go veiled, that is, with their heads covered, as an indication of their inferior status to men. And I bring up some of these passages because if you spend time, as I do, lurking in places where fundamentalists and anti-feminists do their thing online, you still find these passages being referred to as justifications for women holding an inferior status to men in modern society. So this is by no means a dead issue. That said, we are not currently talking about Catholic medieval Europe. We're talking about early modern Europe, and particularly the Protestant part of it. And the status of women did change to a degree after the Protestant Reformation, but not to a degree that we might perhaps wish had happened. For example, it became far more common for women to be educated in the home in Protestant families than in Catholic families for the simple reason of direct engagement with biblical text being seen as central in Protestant theology, to one's salvation. So parents who could teach their children to read would often teach both their sons and their daughters to read because they wanted their daughters to be able to engage the Bible as well. That is, education became a matter of religious salvation, and in the best cases this consideration extended to daughters as well as to sons. On the other hand, Martin Luther himself was kind of a misogynist, actually kind of a bastard. He writes, for example, If women become tired or even die, that does not matter. Let them die in childbirth. That's why they are there. Or, there's always this little gem, The word and works of God is quite clear that women were made either to be wives or prostitutes. Or, if you prefer, God created Adam master and lord of living creatures, but Eve spoilt all when she persuaded him to set himself above God's will Tis you women with your tricks and artifices that lead men into error. Or, I'll just give you one more. Men have broad and large chests and small narrow hips, and more understanding than women who have but small narrow breasts and broad hips, to the end that they should remain at home, sit still, keep house, and bear and bring up children. So, there was no time in early modern Europe where there was anything resembling equality for women. That said, generally speaking, women were better off in Protestant countries than they were in Catholic ones, and generally speaking as well, better off in England 
than elsewhere. Partly, probably, because England had a very successful queen during the Elizabethan period, who managed to control the realm on her own authority and by her own wits, belying the notion that women were not capable of engaging in public affairs. That said, even in Elizabethan England, which is the period we're looking at for Jane Anger, women were under very strict control. They could not vote. Girls and unmarried women were under the legal authority of their father, or if their father was dead, their nearest male relative, sometimes even a younger brother. Married women were under the authority of their husband. This, by the way, is why Queen Elizabeth never married. A widowed woman had a relative degree of freedom as long as she didn't remarry because she had passed from the authority of her father to the authority of her husband who had died and there was no man left to have authority over her unless she did remarry. Women, of course, could not attend university in England. In fact, were not allowed to attend university in England until, I believe, the early 20th century or possibly later 19th. And even if educated privately, there were certain fields that were effectively closed to women. Biblical translation, biblical interpretation or theology, for example, and any of the professions requiring an education, as well as publishing books with some interesting exceptions. Pregnant women were allowed to publish books, and the genre to which they were generally confined was parental advice books. Now, during the Elizabethan period, roughly 800 first editions were printed by pregnant women writing parental advice books. And the rationale here is that because mortality in childbirth was so common that it was entirely possible that a woman's only contribution to her child's upbringing would be her published work because there was a very strong possibility she wouldn't be there herself. So the publishing of parental advice books became sort of a, um, almost a surrogate parenthood. Now I've read several of these books and many of them are politically quite savvy using the guise of parental advice to make arguments for the equality of education of men and women, for example, or rather of boys and girls. That is, there was an awareness of and a rebellion against the strictly enforced gender inequality of the period. I'll return to that in a moment. In the meantime, regarding the legal status of women in Elizabethan England, they could be beaten by their husbands so long as the public peace was not disturbed. That is, the well-being of the woman was not at issue. What was at issue was disturbing the neighbors. And a woman could not sue for divorce. If a husband sued for divorce, which he could do, he retained custody of the children. And the husband has sexual rights to the wife's body. These rights are not reciprocated. That is, the wife does not have sexual rights to the husband's body. And Marital rape is not recognized in England as a thing until sometime in the late 20th century. I can't recall the exact year off the top of my head. But getting back to the discourse on the nature of women, perhaps I should mention that this discourse has a name. It's called the Querelle des Femmes, the argument about women, and it dates back to the Middle Ages. And in fact, since the advent of the printing press at the end of the Middle Ages, it was, when we're looking at short publications, pamphlets such as Jane Anger's, the second most widely publicized debate or topic of discourse in England after the polemic debate between Catholics and Protestants. That is, it was an integral part of the print culture of the time. That said, it's a debate that up until 1589 appears to have been conducted by men and for men, largely as a rhetorical exercise, even a playful exercise, where men would sharpen their rhetorical skills so that they could practice them on more serious matters. There are even multiple cases of men publishing pamphlets on one side and then on the other side, simply, as I said, practicing their rhetorical skills, honing their wits, and exercising their intellects. Jane Anger, in 1589, appears to be the first woman to weigh in in the Carrel de Femme in print, and this is one of the reasons why I've chosen to focus on her. Now, it's entirely possible that Jane Anger is a pen name. People wrote under pen names all the time, so there is a great deal of uncertainty about her identity. But while um, 
While her name obviously could be a pen name, and she even addresses early in the pamphlet the anger with which she writes, there were actually five Jane Angers living in England at the time. Unfortunately, no other surviving published works, though references to other surviving published works remain. So whoever wrote this, whichever of the Jane Angers it may have been, the document is pretty much a standalone, and it's responding to a pamphlet that is explicitly anti-feminist in its argument, but unfortunately, the pamphlet to which she is responding also doesn't survive. That said, I should maybe say a little bit about the text itself, maybe give you an indication of how you might approach it, and then discuss maybe one or two of the questions that Jane Anger addresses. One question to bear in mind, of course, is who is the intended audience? and why. That is, to whom is it actually addressed, and what's the rhetorical purpose of the particular mode of address that she uses? I'll get back to that in a moment. You might also want to consider that for a short piece, this is really an intellectual and scholarly tour de force. And it's a tour de force in fields in which, at the time, women were not supposed to participate. She engages in biblical interpretation and classical scholarship. She also has many different modes in which she argues. She argues by anecdote, she argues by evidence-based reasoning, she argues by deductive argument, and she employs a great deal of both irony and sarcasm. So rhetorically as well, it's, it's quite a goldmine actually. What you'll want to ask yourself is why she is showcasing her intellect so much why she's showcasing her learning, and why she's writing in a style that is explicitly modeled on the Latin scholarly prose that was a prestige discourse in learned society. And now what I think I'm going to do, rather than record the rest of the lecture which has to do with interpretation of the text, is post this bit as part one so that you can listen to the introduction and then post part two a little later, probably tomorrow. I hope you find this useful, and there will be more coming soon. Thanks very much. Bye for now.